a sultry socialite. Why the door coming back to Miami? I love Miami. When she walked into a room, all heads turned. A taboo tryst. A beautiful woman, adultery and incest, it was fodder for the media. You name a kinky form of sex and he was into it. And a high stakes whodunit. The sex, the murder, and money. That's what people are drawn to, like a mosquito to a light. A tabloid tale so steamy, even the trial had to be censored. Tonight, on Power, Privilege, and Justice. In 1964, Miami, Florida was a great escape for jet setters in need of a little R&R. &R. By day, they sailed and sunbathed on their private beaches. By night, they sipped martinis and socialized at the Eden Rock and Hotel Fontainebleau. Enter Jacques and Candy Mosler, high flyers from Houston with a taste for the ocean air. They seem to have it all. Buckets of money, a beachfront condo, and invitations to the best parties. But their beautiful life was about to come crashing down. Jack Mosler had built a great fortune in the automobile finance business and the banks. He was quite a brilliant financial businessman. He had banks, I think, in Houston, Chicago, and then he opened in Miami. On June 29th, around 4.30 a.m., police get an emergency call from Key Biscayne's most exclusive condo, the Governor's Lodge. At Unit 2C, Candace Mosler is waiting for them. And they walked into a crime scene. Jock Mosler lay splayed on the living room floor, chest basically shredded by a knife. Somebody stabbed him 39 times and then bashed his head in with a glass bird that was sitting on a coffee table in the apartment. Candy says that at 4.30 a.m., she returned to the condo, found her husband, and called police. The condition of Jock Mosler's body indicated a crime of passion. Multiple stabbings always indicate some kind of an emotional connection, some hatred between the victim and the perpetrator. There were also defensive cuts to his hands, so he died fighting his attacker. Police generally look into family, they look for friends, they usually don't look for strangers that would stab somebody 50 times or 30 times. That's uh, somebody who is there for vengeance. Neighbors tell investigators that they were awakened by strange noises around 2 a.m. They heard a barking dog, and they heard some muffled groans and moans and thumps and whatnot. At least two neighbors determined that it came from Jacques Mosler's home, and they went over and knocked on the door and shouted, are you OK, are you OK? Candy says she last saw her husband alive at 1 AM when she and the children left the apartment. As Candace said, she was suffering from a continuous bout with migraine headaches. So she went over to the hospital in the middle of the night. She stopped en route strangely enough, to mail a letter at a hotel post office. She then went to a hospital. She was gone from the house for three, four, five, six hours. How peculiar that Mrs. Mosler, kids in tow, just happened to take a late night outing at the time of the murder. But given the nature of Jacques' business dealings, the police couldn't leave any stone unturned. Jock Mosler was essentially a corporate repo man. He made a lot of enemies in his businesses because people don't like the repo man's hook to come and tow away their new Fords or take away their new GE refrigerators and so forth. When police take Candy downtown for questioning, she insists it must have been a burglary gone wrong since Jacques' wallet has been emptied of $500. But when police say they believe it was a crime of passion, the widow comes up with a startling new theory. She claims her husband had been cheating on her, 
with a man. There had been allegations that Jack Mosler was homosexual and that it could have been a gay lover. Because he was found in a bathrobe with no other clothing on, there was a great deal of speculation that it had been the male romantic interest of his who had come into the condo and for one reason or another they had gotten into an altercation. But that speculation is quickly trumped when investigators find Jacques Mosler's diary. It turns out Mrs. Mosler is the one hiding the dirty little secret. She was having an affair. One of the bits of evidence that turned up during the investigation was Jacques Mosler's diary, in which he wrote about the relationship that his wife was having. One of the entries said, if they don't kill me first, I'll have to kill them. And this kind of stunned the police who were looking into this case because it's sort of pointing fingers at those that he thought might murder him, and he turns up murdered. Naughty, naughty girl. It was hurricane season in Miami, but nothing would hit the coast harder than the sordid secrets that were about to be revealed. What new developments are there in this case? Can you tell us? It would be detrimental to the successful conclusion of this case for this office to discuss the evidence in this case or our future plans with the news media. I am sorry. I knew that this case would be high priority for the public news media. Whenever you have a situation like that, you have to be very, very cautious with every move that you make. As Candy buries her dead husband, the media grabs the story and runs with it. There was Mosler this and Mosler that. The papers were just filled with the, the references of who done it. Very quickly, the news media started picking up the fact that Candace was in Biscayne Bay. It was she involved. But on the other side of that coin, there was a lot of speculation because it was reputed that there were many, many enemies of Shock Mosler, that some of his dealings had financially devastated a number of people. At the Mosler's condo, police find fresh palm and fingerprints that don't belong to anyone in the household. Then, at the Miami International Airport, another mysterious discovery. A Mosler company car abandoned in short-term parking. Inside, cops turn up flecks of blood and fingerprints that match the ones at the crime scene. But before investigators can zero in on a suspect, they need to take a closer look at the man behind the millions. Jacques Mosler was born in Romania, emigrated with his parents as a young boy, spent a little bit of time in New York, and then ended up in Chicago. And he was kind of a classic American immigrant bootstrapper story. He really brought himself up from nothing. But... At age 13, after his father died, Jacques quit school to help support his struggling family. He started as a newsboy, but soon found a more lucrative gig, loan sharking. A few years later, Mosler parlayed his skills into a job in the finance department of a car dealership. The enterprising young man had found his niche. This was roughly 1920 when automobiles were, were booming in America. Everybody wanted an automobile, so it was a boom business. He soon jumped into another high-profit area, consumer credit. Soldiers were coming home. Everybody needed a new refrigerator and a new stove and a new oven. He ended up with a total of about 40 consumer credit companies and banks. He had them in Chicago, New Orleans, South Florida, Miami area, and Houston. And his slogan was, we're the yes bank. When other banks say no, we say yes. That would mean that the average person could walk in and, yes, you have your loan. Of course, the interest rate would be sky high, but you would still get your loan. In the late 1920s, Jacques married his longtime girlfriend, Evelyn. The couple moved to New Orleans, where they raised four daughters. But his private life suffered at the expense of his public success. And in 1947, after their children were grown, the couple divorced. The wealthy bachelor didn't stay on the market for long. Months after his first marriage went bust, 
a gorgeous blonde pixie walked into his office and changed his life forever. Candy was a lovely young thing, 28 years old, blonde, charming, charmed the pants off you. And he was smitten. He was absolutely smitten by Candy. Candace Weatherby was born in 1920 on a farm in Buchanan, Georgia, one of 12 barefoot but happy siblings. After dropping out of high school, Candy married a young engineer and had two children. But being a housewife wasn't her life's calling. For Candy, Buchanan got too small very early in her life. Candace got a divorce, packed up the kids, and ended up in New Orleans, where she opened the Candace Finishing School and Model Agency. She was soon rubbing elbows with the high society crowd. When God made Candace, he threw away the mold. I'm glad to see you. She had a southern honey dripping accent when she spoke. Everybody was her honey and her love and her sweetheart. When she walked in the room and said, hello, y'all, the honey just dripped. She was coiffed perfectly. Her clothing, her gloves, her shoes and her purse matched. She was in the latest fashion. She wore these huge stiletto heels. When she walked into a room, all heads turned. She had a personality that would equal that of, I would say, Marilyn Monroe. Candy got involved with the New Orleans Opera becoming one of their top fundraisers. On her list of prospective donors was freshly divorced millionaire Jacques Mosler. She had him penciled in for $350. He sprang for $25. Like I said, he was a corporate repo man, and he didn't give up money easily. But uh, they had some kind of a connection there and were married just six months after they met. Marrying Jacques came with a posh new home in Houston, a 28-room mansion in the exclusive neighborhood of River Oaks. It was huge, and it was furnished beautifully, and it was luxurious. She had it really well in Houston. Her husband loved her. He lavished her with jewelry and brand new cars. She had a $5,000 a month uh, household budget. But Candace didn't settle for being a trophy wife. She sat on the board of directors for Jacques' companies while continuing her society work. But she filled the role the uh, same way Jackie Kennedy would uh, fill the role to, uh, to JFK to be the first lady. She was really his first lady and outstanding at her efforts. She was very involved in the rodeo, which is a very big thing in Houston. And she was involved in many charities. And she was always in the social columns and that sort of thing in Houston. Candy's benevolence stretched far beyond tea parties and charity balls. On a business trip to Chicago in 1957, she read about a terrible crime. A gentleman there had killed his wife, uh, shot her. There were four young children that were left of that marriage, and Candace decided that she and Jack Mosler should adopt those four children. The Mosler mansion was getting pretty crowded, but as far as Candy was concerned, there was always room for one more, especially when family was concerned. Melvin Lane Powers was the son of Candy's older sister, Elizabeth Weatherby. Big, strong, strapping guy, six foot four, built like a professional football linebacker, good looking, jet black hair. His mother was worried about his future well being, and she called her sister Candy, living in the lap of luxury down in Houston, and said, Listen, Melvin's having problems. I'm concerned about him. Can you take him in? Can you get him a job? A few days later, the 17-year-old landed on their doorstep. Jacques gave him a job at his company and groomed him for a career in finance. Candy dressed him in designer suits and introduced him to the society set. Over the next two years, young Melvin seemed to be living a fairy tale. But behind the scenes, it was reading more like Pulp Fiction. There are no secrets in a mansion among the servants. And over time, there were some whispers 
among the servants and the staff at River Oaks that uh, Mel and Candy's relationship had gone from auntie and nephew to something illicit. One of the maids finally tipped Jacques off. In a rage, the millionaire searched the mansion for his wife's diary. When he finally found it, his fears were confirmed. 41-year-old Candy and her 19-year-old nephew were having an affair. I don't care how fabulous you are. Sex with the kinfolk doesn't pass muster in any social circle. Soon, there was a lot of talk that Candy's roots were showing. You can take the girl out of backwater Georgia, but you can't take the backwater out of the girl. One of the first things that Jock Mosler did was go to a lawyer. He considered bringing in a lawsuit against his nephew for ruining his marriage. The lawyer advised him against it, told him that the publicity would be a nightmare. And, you know, why bother? Why not just get him out of your life? So Mosler evicted him from the River Oaks mansion and had him fired at his job. But Mel didn't go quietly. And he had some choice words to say to Jacques Mosler. One of the things he said was, I'll be back and you will regret this as the longest day of your life. In July of 64, the Jacques Mosler murder mystery tops the list of summer beach reading in Miami. And with the country's tabloid writers and gossip columnists also picking up the scent, police are under intense pressure to solve the case. The investigation shifts into high gear when detectives find out that two months before his murder, Jacques had uncovered his wife's incestuous affair. There was not a healthy relationship between himself and his wife's nephew, Melvin Lane Powers. The police had discovered that, lo and behold, Melvin Lane Powers had actually threatened Jack Mosler. It had to be somebody they thought that Jacques knew because the condo wasn't broken into. They knew that Candace physically didn't do this. There would be no possible way. Melvin Lane Powers was of a size, of a stature. He was a kind of a person that looked like he had the ability to come in and overpower Jacques Mosler. Investigators learn that even after Jacques booted Mel from the mansion, he couldn't keep the lovebirds apart. Candy and Mel absolutely did continue a relationship. People basically had seen them canoodling and hugging and kissing and so on and so forth. With the Mosslers now married in name only, Mel and Candy carried on their torrid affair. I like the pictures you sent of yourself with the gold sweater on. I became so hot just looking at your breast pushing up against those cross straps. You don't have to be concerned about anyone. Only you, my love. You are the one for me. I was in the bathtub, and I just laid back and was with you very, very close. You are my God. I'd do anything for your love. Police find an airline ticket agent who knew them. On one occasion, she remembers Candy being at the counter buying a ticket with Melvin Powers and that Candy had on a fur coat. But the fur coat opened up and she saw that Candy didn't have anything on underneath. Talk about traveling light. When it came to Mel, Candy had no shame, and why should she? She wasn't about to divorce Jacques, and if he left her, she could have her cake and eat it too. They had a motivation for staying together as husband and wife. Candy apparently had signed some kind of an agreement that if she filed for divorce from Jacques Mosler, she would get only $200,000. Mosler, of course, understood that under prevailing laws that if he filed for divorce, Candy was liable to get half of his estate, which was worth $33 million at that point. With the relationship fractured beyond repair, 
Jacques moved into the Key Biscayne condo full time and ran his empire from Miami. In late June, the children were on summer vacation from school and Candy had them at home in Key Biscayne. Jacques Mossler was there at the same time. Detectives discover that Mel was there too. He was seen at the Holiday Inn bar by an eyewitness just before the murder. Now, the Holiday Inn was just a short drive away from the governor's lodge where the murder took place, and they identified Powers as being there. Not long after last call, someone would pay Jacques Mosler a surprise visit, leaving him brutally murdered on the living room floor. The police said, you know, everything is pointing to Melvin Wayne Powers as having been there. He's the one who probably did this. Airline records indicate that Mel bought a ticket and flew back to Houston just hours after Jacques Mosler's body was found. Detectives also learned that the car left in the airport garage had been signed out by Candy. It's time to head to Texas to confront Mel. They went got a warrant, collected physical evidence from his place, and found blood spots on the clothing that he was wearing that night. Not only do his fingerprints match the set found in the car, they're the same as the ones lifted from the crime scene. Melvin Powers is arrested and charged with murder. It was a substantial amount of physical evidence. Combine that with the circumstantial evidence of the relationship between Candy and Mel, and prosecutors had a pretty good case. But Candy is determined to get Mel the best defense her dead husband's money can buy. When Mel Powers was charged, Candace had made arrangements through her daughter to retain Percy Foreman. Mr. Foreman has been a very dear family friend of my husband and I for 16 years. You called Percy Foreman when this occurred, the great criminal lawyer. Percy Foreman at that time in Houston was very flamboyant, was a well-known criminal defense attorney, and was known for his theatrics in court and being able to get people off and do it in a flash. Percy Foreman wanted $200,000 cash up front, but the Mosler money was frozen. No problem. Candy invited the attorney over, and after picking through her belongings, he helped himself to his fee and her diamonds and furs. Doc Mosler probably spun in his grave knowing that the jewelry that he had bought his wife as gifts was now going to pay for the defense of his murder. Considering the amount of money that's involved here and considering what the charge is, it didn't surprise me in the least that Percy would come in here. With Mel in good hands, Candy flees to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota for months of migraine treatments. Because she was in Rochester in the hospital for a lot of that time, she wasn't visible here in Houston. That kind of also led to, to the mystique of the whole thing. But no hospital can save her from the evidence cops are about to turn up. We developed several other individuals, all who had some attachment to the Mosler family, who had been solicited by both Candace and Melvin Powers to murder Jack Mosler. A pair of ex-cons, one a carnival worker, the other a gas station attendant, claim Mel offered them 10 grand to kill Jacques. Another jailbird with a long rap sheet says the couple gave him $7,000 as a down payment for the job, but he never went through with it. More than a year after Jacques Mosler's death, Candy is indicted on murder charges. She arms herself with two more of Houston's elite attorneys, Marion Rosen and the renowned Clyde Woody. Clyde Woody and I were having lunch. The secretary actually came to the restaurant and said that there was an emergency phone call. It was Candace Mosler. Candy's lawyers immediately advise her to fly from Rochester to Miami and surrender herself to police. The most sensational trial of the decade was slated to kick off in January of 66. Top reporters like my old friend Theo Wilson of the New York Daily News and Lewis Lapham, then with the Saturday Evening Post, were already packing their bags for Miami. 
everyone wanted a front row seat for the circus. More than a year after her husband was brutally slain, Candy Mosler checks out of the Mayo Clinic and flies back to Florida to face murder charges. At the Miami International Airport, she surrenders herself to police. The cameras are rolling. She is coming down the corridor, and of course she is just dressed beautifully. And one of the reporters runs up to her and said, Miss Mosler, you have been accused of adultery, you've been accused of incest, you've been accused of murder. What do you have to say to that? And she batted her eyes and smiled and said, well, sir, nobody's perfect. She um, gave the impression, why am I here? I had nothing to do with this. Why are you prosecuting me? I'm not worried about this. I'm going to be found not guilty. That was her position from day one. Candy enters her plea, is fingerprinted and booked. We discussed it very clearly with Candace and said, now you're going to have to stay in jail, but this is really going to be advantageous to your case. She said, that's fine, I'll stay in jail. Candy trades in her Dior and pearls for a jailhouse frock and spends 14 days in the Dade County lockup. In true Candy Mosler fashion, her release from jail became a glitzy photo op. As the other inmates showered her with hearty obscenities, she blew kisses and waved as though she was on the red carpet at a Hollywood premiere. Usually you tell your client he's charged with a criminal offense, you don't talk to the media, you know. But she handled herself so beautifully. She loved the celebrity status because Candace was a star and loved it. Mrs. Mosler, how does it feel to be free on bond? It feels wonderful, thank you. What you expected? Oh, well, I have a lot of faith in the good people of Miami and Dade County. Thank you. It's marvelous to be back with my children. Do you have any plans to come back to Miami before the trial? Oh, I'd adore coming back to Miami. I love Miami. I, th I think my grandbaby likes Miami also. As the trial date approaches, the spotlight only grows. This case had everything. It had a very wealthy man whose wife had been charged with having solicited his murder, and she solicited her nephew with whom she was having an affair. When you put money, murder, and sex together, especially sex within the same family, this to the media is big stuff. Despite her increasing popularity, prosecutors aren't charmed. They believe her alibi the night of the murder is shaky at best. Somebody of Candace's affluence could very easily afford to have her personal physician come to the apartment to see her, even if it's in the middle of the night. Why would she go to Jackson Memorial Hospital and take the kids with her, other than just to make sure that she's not around the apartment when this is going on? The second strike against Candy is that she had a very obvious motive. This man had run the largest automobile financing venture in America. He also has the major shareholder in four separate banks, and there are many, many other properties. So she uh, stood to inherit a tremendous amount of money if he died. Melbourne Lane Powers had nothing. Candace Mosler would inherit everything. Melvin Lane Powers said, well, Jock Mosler is in my way. I am having a relationship with Candace. I want to be able to continue that relationship, and I want the money. We expected, uh, based upon the information in the newspaper, it would be a fairly quick trial. Normally, you come in with Anne having sex with her nephew and killing the husband. <laughs> That's a pretty open and shut case. The prosecution thought they had the cat in the bag. But when you're facing a defendant with a boatload of money, power, and charm, justice almost always takes a back seat. Here in the Dade County Courthouse, this is what is known as the big courtroom. It's room 6-1. 
And this is where big legal drama of the year, perhaps the biggest in the United States, will begin next week. Charge will be first degree murder. The prosecution will charge that a 47-year-old grandmother, Candace Mossler, and her nephew and alleged lover, 24-year-old Melvin Lane Powers, did conspire to and did murder her millionaire husband. On February 1st, 1966, the Jacques Mossler murder trial opens in Miami. Journalists from across the country are staked out. As you approach the Dade County Courthouse, there were cameras and reporters and microphones everywhere. And, you know, there was just a huge flock following us up to the courtroom. Eddie, tell him how you come to come with me today. Well, I, I did, I made up all my work so I could come with you. How old do you know, Eddie? 11? 11. Mm -hmm. Yes. You made up all your work? I tell him why you want to come with me so bad. So that those people couldn't take Mother and lock her up anymore. This trial is going to get heavy and extensive radio, magazine, television, and newspaper coverage, not only in this country, but all around the world. The gallery was packed every day with reporters from papers far and wide. It was a story that was reported breathlessly back in an era when there wasn't a lot of breathless reporting. The state is attempting to prove that Melvin Powers and his aunt plotted Mossler's murder because of a torrid love affair. The Powers public likes to hear about salacious matters going on, and this one had it all. And as the trial finally gets started, the public is in a frenzy. What is the big attraction? Well, I think it's exciting and has mystery. Do you think that's a big attraction for most folks? Yes, I do. It's a very unusual case. Every day you came here, you could see all the people just lined up waiting to come into it. It was just the big show. The big circus was there, and everybody wanted to get in the act and get a first-hand seat so they could see what was going on, get the dirt. The testimony at this trial was so illicit Spectators under 21 were turned away at the door, but they could read all about it in the Miami News, which printed the day's most torrid tidbits on hot pink paper. People across the country were riveted. You had a terrible scenario of an aunt having sex with her nephew, cheating on your husband, and they thought that would infect the whole trial. And of course, you're talking about a 1960s jury. There was going to be no getting around the fact that they had had an affair for a long-standing period of time. And when you're trying a case of this sort, even though they were not on trial for incest, they were not on trial for adultery, what they were on trial for was murder. After airing all the sordid details of the incestuous relationship, the prosecution swings for the fences with their case against Mel. Being able to show that he flew in that morning of the murder and then flew out right after the murder, the fact that he was seen and identified by a witness at the Holiday Inn bar right down the street from the governor's lodge where the murder took place, Plus the fact that he had been thrown out by the police from Mossler's house in Houston about a year before for threatening Mossler, we felt was a pretty strong case. Would the jury believe that because Mel was in Miami for that short period of time, was he there for just one reason, and that to kill Jack Mossler? They had dots of blood in the car. They had dots of blood on the clothing that he was wearing at the time that he returned from Houston after the strange one-night trip to Miami. It was a substantial pile of evidence, both physical and circumstantial. The palm print and the fingerprint found in the apartment on surfaces that had been cleaned that day, which definitely put him in that apartment. So we felt that that was the strongest part of our case. Percy Foreman's uh, defense basically was to say there were 30 other palm prints there or fingerprints, and it could have been any of the 30, but those 30 prints that they had would have been people who perhaps were invited, and there's no way that Mel Powers would have been invited into Jack's living room or kitchen. For weeks, the two sides battle it out inside the courtroom. But outside, it's Candy's show. She was received coming and going to the courthouse every day like an actor would be um, arriving for the Emmys. I don't 
Were you ever in love with him? Oh, of course not. I don't know what to say, sir. What would, what would you say if there was a charge against you? There were crowds outside the courthouse that crowded around her, people asking for autographs of the key players in the trial. The courtroom was the hottest ticket going in the 1960s. People didn't want to give up their seats. They had brought their lunch bags with them, would eat their lunch in the courtroom. And it was like being at the movie theater. Somebody would get up to leave, and one of the bailiffs would come out and say, you know, I got two on the aisle. The state continues to attack Mel and Candy. Several witnesses take the stand, some with rap sheets, others in handcuffs. But the cast of ex-cons leaves a dubious impression. The prosecutors probably had a highly winnable case based on both the physical and the circumstantial evidence against Candy Mosler and her nephew. Unfortunately, they went too far. There were a slew of derelicts that had been brought by the prosecution from jails in Texas and in Arkansas. And what we found is that many of these derelicts were willing to testify to anything because they want a free trip to Miami. Frank Mulvey, here's a guy they brought in and they started about his drug addiction. So they asked him about where he was shooting up and he says, well, he says, I only have one place now I can shoot up and that's in my private park. Everybody just looked at him like, and you bring this person in as a witness. Mel and Candy's lawyers suddenly realize the tide has just turned in their favor. The case is now theirs to lose. The defense all understood what they had. The prosecution had laid victory in their lap. And they basically closed down their defense at that time. They decided we don't have to prove anything because they haven't proved that our clients killed him. In a strategic move, Percy Foreman doesn't call a single witness. Under Florida law, that gives him the right to the last closing argument. So he would be the last words to the jury. And that's where Percy shone. Leave any person in the room with Percy Foreman for four hours, they would be convinced of uh, the, the fact that the moon is square. By the end of closing arguments, the gallery and the jury are split. At least for the present, the color and excitement of the Mosler Powers murder trial have disappeared. The big guns have been fired for the state and the defense, and only the decision of the jury remains. When we went back in the jury room there, they had certain people that had already made up their mind that they were guilty. And then there was the group that I was in that figured they, they didn't prove a case. We didn't get hostile right away, but later on, it was getting a little hostile with one another. After four days of contentious deliberation, the jury finally reaches a verdict. The judge called into the courtroom the defendant and the prosecution team and the defense team and the press and so forth. And the jury foreman says, not guilty. The courtroom erupts in cheers. We were all so thrilled and elated, of course, with the verdict. What is your reaction, Mel? Yes, I'm very happy. It was an OJ verdict style bedlam. Hundreds of people had gathered to see Candy and Mel. One of the reporters asks Candy if she and Mel intend to get married. She said, of course not. As though it were the most absurd suggestion in the world. After the judge finally restored order, Candy kissed all the men on the jury, exited the courtroom on Mel's arm, and drove off into the sunset in a gold Cadillac. What a finale. When Candace Mosler and her nephew Mel walk out of court unscathed, the state feels the sting of defeat. The jury felt that it was a circumstantial evidence case, and the only thing really tying them to the murders were three witnesses that actually said that they had been solicited to commit the crime. And when those witnesses basically fell apart on cross-examination, then the jury figured there just wasn't enough to convict them. But some say it was Candy's charm alone that doomed the prosecution's case. Oh, no, I have all the faith in the world in the people of Miami, and I love everyone. 
everybody in Miami. I think they're wonderful people. They would have to, if they did convict Mel, consider convicting Candy because she had the same motive that he had. The, the jury never got to the position of convicting Mel because I think they knew that the lead over would be to Candy. Melvin Powers was very lucky to have Candy Mosler sitting at the next table over as part of his defense team. And she charmed and seduced everybody in the courtroom, probably including the jurors. Back in Houston, Candy and Mel pick up where they left off. They continue to go together for a while, and then they seem to drift apart after that. Uh, Mel got involved in the building business, and I think Candace helped him get a start, and he became actually a very successful builder. Candy Mosler um, grew the business. She turned out to be a fairly shrewd businesswoman. By the mid-70s, uh, the value of her personal estate was up to about $100 million, so she tripled the size of uh, what she got. As for the murder of Jacques Mosler, the case remains officially unsolved. It's an American tragedy that this individual was murdered and no one was ever brought to justice for it. And absolutely, that detail gets lost because of all the bling bling that surrounded um, Candy Mosler and the coverage of her trial. Right after the trial was over, I had some people in the news media call me and said, well, now that Candy and Mel have been found not guilty, are you going to go on out and find the real killers? And I said, no, we're not going to do anything because in our mind, the two people who committed this crime were found not guilty by the jury. So there's nothing that we're going to do to find out who did it because we know who did it. And it was Candy and Mel. In 1976, at Miami's Hotel Fontainebleau, Candy Mosler died in her sleep after an overdose of migraine medication. Some claim it was a tragic accident. Others say her guilt had finally caught up to her. For Court TV, I'm Dominic Dunn.